So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lucia Dolce. I'm the chair of the Center of Buddhist Studies here at SOAS. And uh, I'm uh, happy to start this uh, third and final lecture for uh, this year, uh, this academic year, uh, in the uh, Robert Hall Family Foundation uh, series on Chinese Buddhists. Uh, as I've said at other times, for those of you who have uh, not been uh, uh, here before, uh, this is the fifth year that we have uh, uh, this lecture series. And uh, um, we've had a, a range of uh, uh, scholars covering uh, uh, Chinese Buddhism uh, from the um, historical and philosophical uh, uh, side to the uh, art history conservation we had last, last week. Um, the lecture series normally has three events uh, per year, and uh, um, we try to look at Chinese Buddhism in a non-confessional way um, as a, a multidisciplinary, with a multidisciplinary approach that allows us to understand the effect of Buddhism on Japanese, on Chinese society. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a mental <laughs> formation. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the series consists in, the, in a lecture, in the public lecture tonight, and uh, in a um, seminar tomorrow morning, which is a, a, a platform for postgraduate students uh, to have a closer interaction with our speakers and to look more closely to the sources of uh, uh, the research that is presented here. Uh, so I hope that uh, some, I mean, a number of you have already registered. And those of you who have not registered are welcome to come. And uh, um, I'm sure, uh, yeah, I'm sure it would be very um, interesting to uh, to have a closer look at both at uh, texts and uh, ethnographic material. So having said that, of course, uh, I'm a very. Uh, I would like to take this chance to uh, thank uh, officially and publicly the foundation for giving us the chance to uh, put up this lecture series and to uh, discuss uh, with eminent scholars um, and uh, the the, the uh, attendees here uh, several aspects of Chinese Buddhism. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Esther Bianchi, uh, who is currently Associate Professor of Chinese Religions and Philosophy and the Society and Cultures of China at the University of Perugia in Italy. Um, Dr. Ba Bianchi is uh, a, a specialist in Buddhism. She has worked in both on imperial and modern and contemporary Buddhism. Um, and. Uh, uh, her, her research has explored uh, Sino-Tibetan Buddhism, Chinese Buddhist monasticism, and the revival of Buddhist monastic discipline in China. I'd like to say something more about her research. Um, her first book, uh, The Iron Statue Monastery, a Buddhist nunnery of Tibetan tradition in contemporary China, which was published in 2001, was one of the very first studies in Western languages to address the interaction of Tibetan and Chinese Buddhism. And she has continued to publish on this topic, uh, for instance, a couple of articles on the uh, Yamantaka Diti, which are very interesting to anyone who does uh, esoteric Buddhism. More recently, she has uh, uh, co-edited an important volume with Shen Weirong on Sino-Tibetan Buddhism Across the Ages, uh, published by Braille in 2021. Uh, which I've discovered can be uh, can, is available online for free. So I would uh, invite uh, yeah. every you to have a look, at least from the SOAS webpage. <laughs> so I'm not uh, not sure outside SOAS. Um, uh, she has also written on on the history of Taoism and uh, translated the first Italian translation of the um, uh, Travels of Xiang. Uh, but uh, more relevant for the lecture today, Dr. Bianchi has co-directed a three-year international research project on the Van Vinaya revival in 20th century China and Taiwan, uh, founded by the uh, Chan Chenghua Foundation. And uh, uh, some of the results of this project have uh, uh, been published even more recently, last year, also with Brill, in a book titled Take the Vinaya as Your Master, uh, which covers different uh, issues in monastic discipline and practices uh, in modern uh, Chinese Buddhism. And I think we will hear something about that today. Uh, currently, she's a member in another international project on Chinese Buddhism and globalization. 
and has been working on the rediscovery of early meditation techniques and the spread of Theravada Buddhism in modern Chinese Buddhism. And I think we will hear something about that in tomorrow's seminar. So a lot of uh, very interesting new insights um, from her research. So join me uh, to welcome her to SOAS. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me if I talk this way? Yes? Okay. So thank you so much. I am, I'm very grateful to Lucia. I, uh, Lucia, uh, we met in uh, New York, I guess it was seven years ago, and she invited me to give a lecture here. And I accepted, but then everything happened, the pandemic, uh, among other things, and uh, we ne never made it, and I'm really happy that we finally made it today. I'm very happy to be here. I'm grateful also to uh, Haruka Saito. She's not here, but she's been following all everything uh, uh, in, from a, an organizational uh, uh, point of view, so I'm, I'm very happy uh, and grateful to her as well, and I'm happy to have friends and colleague, colleagues here in the audience today. So uh, what I am going to talk about today is a topic I've been working on uh, since a few years now, and I have already two um, publications about that, but it's I'm going to present to you an ongoing research which will eventually um, uh, be published. Uh, so it, it will eventually uh, become a third publication on dual ordinations. And um, this is, uh, uh, so the topic is dual ordinations, so Arpuzentier. Uh, these are procedures that are established in the Vinaya texts, uh, but they were mostly disregarded in China for at least one millennium. We will go back to this in a while. But, and these very um, um, ordination issues, they became a prominent topic of discussion during the 30s and 40s, and, and that happened within this Vinaya revival movement that was happening at that time. And this eventually resulted in their reintroduction in the 70s in Taiwan and in the 80s in China. I'm not going to talk about Taiwan here today. There is a, um, an article about the reinstatement of dual ordinations in Taiwan by Liu Zhen in the edited volume that uh, Lucia mentioned before, Professor Do Dolce mentioned before. So today, uh, uh, dual ordinations are the only ordination system for big shunis in mainland China, which is not true for Taiwan, again. But I will really no more mention the Taiwanese case. So this uh, topic was already at the core of my uh, recent or not, no, no, no more so recent study uh, on reading equality into a symmetry, dual ordination in the eyes of modern Chinese bhikshunis, which was published in 22. And uh, it uh, was meant to introduce the historical developments leading to the restoration of the ordination system, of the dual ordination system. So just one month and a few uh, days after my uh, article was published, a Venerable Zongxin, a vice president of the Buddhist Association of China, released an online contribution commemorating the 40th anniversary of the restoration of the dual ordination. And this contribution is very precious, it's very important, and that's why I opened again this topic which I thought was closed, and I'm working on this again. Because um, it um, incorporated previously uh, unavailable material uh, from the archives, uh, uh, unavailable to me at least, from the archives of the Buddhist Association of China. And, uh, uh, including a partial uh, correspondence between the two big shunis, the two nuns, uh, Long Lian and Tong Yuan, who are uh, the promoters of the uh, reinstatement of dual ordinations uh, in the uh, early 80s. And um, so, the, as you can imagine, the correspondence, uh, which is, um, Unfortunately, it's only partial. We only have Tong Yuan's letters. We don't have Long Lian's letters. But it's still incredibly um, precious and, and valuable because it kind of gives us uh, a new insight into the topic. And that's why I am today going to present to you some of its contents. Um, 
In addition uh, to this, the, the other archival uh, material that was provided by Zonsin's article consists of lists of masters bestowing the precepts and of the attendees and of the ordinees. Uh, present at the first uh, ordination in 82. And that's also important material which adds uh, a few information to what we knew before. That's for Dong Xin's article, but uh, at the same time, I took the uh, opportunity uh, given to me by this, uh, by this uh, uh, publication also to go back to the uh, manual, to the uh, ordination manual, to the procedures that were used for the first uh, bhikshuni ordination in China and that have been used afterwards in China as well. Uh, these are, uh, you can see them here, these are the, uh, so the Arpu Senjie, uh, the dual ordination procedures by Vinaya Master Shu Yu. We are at the uh, beginning of the Qin Dynasty. And uh, um, this text um, that you see in this slide was published in 2013 by the uh, Jinlin Buddhist Scripture Publishing and it is a re-edition of uh, a um, rite with uh, including uh, Tong Yuan and, uh, and uh, her Vinaya Master Sejo's notes on the procedures. So this is a very important uh, material which I only had uh, in my hands uh, recently, uh, thanks uh, to a Venerable Tupten Tamcho, who uh, shared it with me. So I am uh, going to present some of the contents and the, my, the, very, first, um, the very first notes about uh, my uh, analysis of this text. Um, so I have been, this is, as I told you, an ongoing pro, uh, project, so I've been presenting some parts of this research already, and eventually it will be published within this uh, uh, special issue uh, edited by uh, Wang Xing Yi on uh, the Vinaya and Buddhist monastic practices for law and society, possibly next year. Okay, so um, an outline. I wanted to take the time. Okay. Um. So um, I will today. I will first uh, introduce very briefly uh, the dual ordination between India and China. So it's a very, uh, very basic presentation. I'm sorry for those that are acquainted with the topic, but I do need to give some information for those that are not. I will then um, try to summarize uh, quick the the um, history of the uh, reinstatement of dual ordinations during the Republican era. That is my uh, my uh, article published in 2022. And finally, I will uh, turn to the uh, topic that I wanted to uh, to to um, present today. So the ab ab adaptation of the procedures. Uh, to the modern times. Uh, and so the reinstating uh, dual ordination by uh, Long Lian and Tong Yuan. So this for the moment. Okay. So the origins of dual ordinations are usually traditionally traced back to the very beginning of female uh, monastic order at the time of the Buddha. So according to the traditional narrative, Buddha Shakyamuni agreed to the request of his aunt uh, and admitted women into the monastic order, provided that the bhikshunis respected the guru dharmas. Uh, eight rules never to be transgressed, meant to prevent the disappearance of Buddhism from the world after the creation of the Bhikshuni Sangha and clearly subjugating Bhikshunis to the Bhikshu, Bhikshu Sangha, so nuns to monks. Here you can see the list of the eight rules uh, uh, translated by Herman and Chio from the Dharmagupta Kavinaya. And the Dharmagupta Kavinaya, as you may know, is the uh, Vinaya that is, has become a standard in, uh, for ritual uses in China since the 7th century. 
So, um, in the Vinaya of the Dharmaguptaka, the fourth rule reads, after having been trained in the six rules uh, for two years as a probationer, a shikshamana, I will go back to the shikshamana figure in a while, so after that, the ordination ceremony of a bhikshuni has to be carried out in both sanghas. Uh, in other words, this rule states that uh, the bhikshuni ordination be divided into two sequential steps and that it requires uh, to be carried out in succession, first in front of the assembly of the bhikshunis and then of the bhikshus. So first in front of ten ordained nuns and then in front of ten ordained monks. So in contemporary China, the dual ordination are, are conferred sorry, a, a, within the triple platform system. It's an ordination system that uh, dates back uh, uh, to the 17th century and which, um, it, it's a, it, which includes the bestowal of three sets of precepts in the same uh, period of time, the novice ones, the bhikshun or bhikshuni ones, and the bodhisattva precepts. As for the bhikshunis, nowadays in China, dual ordinations are conferred. But this was not so for many years. Um, I should also add that for us, for the uh, novice ordination, in, uh, uh, according to the Dharmagupta Kavinaya, so in China, uh, the uh, vows, the precepts to be taken are the same for, for the same number for um, male and female novices. And, um, and I should also add that um, very often in, uh, in, in, uh, in um, imperial times, uh, the Shramanerika uh, ordination was uh, uh, bestowed by a monk, so by a bhikshu and not by a bhikshuni, uh, even if uh, the Vinaya texts uh, uh, requires that a bhikshuni is involved. Okay, so as for dual ordinations in China, they were introduced introduced in the year 433, so in the 5th century, um, thanks to the arrival of two, uh, actually two groups of uh, nuns from Sri Lanka, which is important for us today. We will go back to Sri Lanka in a while, as you will see. And, uh, but, but they were mostly dis discarded after the song. They're mentioned during the Tang Dynasty, then they're mentioned again in the song at the beginning of the Qing. But, uh, and at the beginning of the Qing, it's when Shu Yu, uh, authored the dual ordination procedures. Shu Yu was the um, disciple of one of the masters uh, uh, that conceived the triple platform ordination. And because of this, he conceived the dual ordination procedures, so these old uh, Indian procedures, uh, within the late imperial China ordination system. So nowadays, Shu Yu's text is used for all female ordinations in mainland China. But throughout the Qing dynasty and during the Republic of China, female ordinations continued to be conferred by the ten bhikshu masters only. So uh, during, also during late imperial times and during the Republic, female ordination was what is uh, commonly called a one sangha ordination and not a dual sangha ordination. Uh, it is important to notice that uh, re differently than the other uh, Vinaya traditions, the Chinese tradition considers ordinations carried out by bhikshus alone to be valid. This is true uh, from the very beginning. Uh, Guna Varman, the Vinaya master that was involved in the first ordination in 433, uh, had uh, um, believed that um, it was possible to retake dual ordination without invalidating the one Sangha ordination, which is important. And, uh, and then he also believed that uh, one Sangha ordination produced an offense, a minor one, uh, on the part of the bhikshus uh, conferring the precepts, but it does not invalidate the ordination of the bhikshunis. 
and undergoing the procedure. So this is a very important, and this very uh, point was also uh, reiterated and uh, in a way uh, made a rule by uh, the famous, uh, most, probably the most important, or one of the most important Vinaya masters uh, in, uh, in, uh, in China, namely Dao Xuan. Uh, Notwithstanding this, the question of the legitimacy of the Wan Sang ordination has been periodically raised throughout history, and this happened again in modern times. So just to finish this first part, uh, I, I mentioned the Shik Shamana, this figure. It's a, a two-year female probationer of which there is no uh, male counterpart. And... Uh, um, the Shik Shamana is a Shramanerika, so a female novice who accepts six precepts for a probationary period of two years. And according to the Dharma Gupta Kavinaya, uh, any transgression implies starting the probation period again. Actually, this only regards the last two uh, of these of the rules: not consuming, to, not to consume alcohol, and not to eat after all uh, afternoon, so in, at improper times. Because, as you can see, the other four are, are very, very uh, bad uh, transgressions that imply uh, actually expulsion from the expulsions from the from the sangha. But still, there is this rule there. Um, this figure, and Herman has uh, explained, uh, was never really common in imperial China. Okay, so let us now go to modern times, uh, Republican era. In, during the Republican era, uh, there was a, um, um, a surge of interest in Vinaya, and, uh, um, and uh, the rules of, of uh, Bhikshuni uh, uh, ordination became a topic of discussion among uh, the Vinaya masters of this movement. Um, it was, as I said, a, a time of Vinaya resurgence, and uh, many masters uh, insisted on establishing uh, legitimate ordination procedures for male and for female candidates. And... Uh, uh, Oops, here. And the irregularity of the ordination system for female monastics uh, when compared with the requirement set up by the Vinayas that we have just seen uh, appeared evident to these Vinaya masters of the era. And this led to a rediscovery of dual ordinations. So... Um, these discussions also uh, in, in involved the uh, two related topics, that of the Sikh Shamana, the two-year probationer, and that of the female master of the discipline, the Upadhyayini, uh, who is meant, according to Vinaya texts, to follow a female candidate from the moment she asked to go forth until the two years after ordination, a rule that was not respected in China, not for, for the novices, neither for, of course, dual ordinations, since we did not have dual ordinations anymore. So the two masters that uh, uh, were most involved in the dual procedures and that really worked to revive them uh, are uh, the Vinaya masters, Thajou and Nanghai. Uh, Zhou and had uh, and Nanghai. Uh, Zhou actually seems to have been able to uh, transmit dual ordinations twice, but they did not. He did not actually uh, achieve in reinstating the the, the system um, in China. Um, Nanghai tried, and, but never really uh, bestowed dual ordinations. But the two uh, main female disciples of them, so Tong Yuan and Long Lian, are the same uh, bhikshunis that worked on that in the early 80s. So they kind of took on their legacy. 
uh, here we can see Master Sejo, who instructed Tong Yuan on, uh, in ordination procedures. So uh, Sejo um, ha um, had a few uh, female disciples, uh, Kai Hui, Shan Yu, In He, who um, converted uh, the Tong Jiao um, Se in Beijing into a, a very important Vinaya uh, center, center nunnery. And uh, um, Tong, uh, Tong Yuan, who took, uh, um, uh, who went forth, so had her tonsure and and uh, and novice ordination uh, with the same Sejo, later joined these nuns at the Tong Jiao Nunnery. So Sejo conferred. It, it, Sejo tra trained the, his female disciples there, including uh, Tong, uh, Tong Yuan, uh, in the uh, for the dual ordinations and. Uh, apparently conferred uh, dual ordinations twice, in 47 and in 55. I say apparently because we only, uh, till uh, recently, we only knew of one of his disciples, Tao Yuan, who, was, uh, who stated that this had happened, but none of the other materials that I could trace uh, was confirming this. Uh, this has been confirmed, however, by Tong Yuan. So this is an important information that we get from the correspondence that has been made available recently. Um, so Tong Yuan herself received full ordination in 1947 according to the dual ordination procedures. And the 1947 uh, ordination is apparently the first new uh, dual ordination of the modern times. Then we know that Tong Yuan um, was um, followed after her ordination by Kai Hui, the big, big Shuni Kai Hui, who uh, acted as her upadiaini, the prince, the master of the female master of the discipline. And this is also important because we can see here an interest in th of Thejo in reinstating also this particular figure. Uh, Tong Yuan was later involved in the 55 dual ordination. We don't know in which role, but probably she was involved in some uh, in, in, in the ordination bestowal. And, uh, and then uh, in one of the, her letters, she tells us that uh, in the early 80s, three of the nuns that had been ordained according to dual procedures in 55 were still living in Beijing. So as you can see, Sejo um, had really trained Tong Yuan, and Tong Yuan had a, 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 a very profound knowledge also going through uh, uh, actual experience of dual ordination. So that's why she was chosen by Long Lian to, um, to help her in revive dual ordination. So when she was asked to do so uh, by the Buddhist Association of China in the early 80s. But let us stay here in, uh, the, during the Republican era, uh, because Long Lian, on the other hand, was introduced to dual ordinations and to the Shikshamana uh, figure by her master, Nanghai. Nanghai, by the way, was a Sino-Tibetan uh, Buddhist master. He was involved in tantric uh, practices, but as far as Vinaya is concerned, he was a Vinaya master and he was uh, a, an expert in, in terms of Dharmagupta Vinaya. So, um, Nanghai uh, believed that women should study as shikshamanas uh, for two years and only then receive dual ordination. So he was aware of the shikshamana important figure to him. Uh, he was also concerned about the fact that bhikshus were unable to instruct bhikshunis after one sangha ordination, uh, which was according to him, contrary to the Buddha's system, and, did, and that does not protect the Dharma. So this implies that he saw the need of uh, uh, Upadhyayini, uh, the need of female masters of the precepts, able to follow uh, a candidate, a female candidate, from tonsure down to the two years after ordination. Um, 
he also arranged uh, for her, his disciples, female disciples, to study with a Vinaya master, Guan Yi, to study dual ordination procedures. And in 48, he had uh, this Guan Yi master uh, impart Shikshamana ordination to his female disciples in Tiesians. This was seen by Nanghai as a first step on the two-year path to full ordination. And he had decided that Long Lian would be the principal uh, bhikshuni master at that ordination ceremony. But that ordination ceremony ne never took place. It was the eve of the foundation of the People's Republic of China, and the conditions were no more possible, no more ripe. So, um, the reinstatement of dual ordination procedures, of the figure of the Shikshamana, and of the role of the Upadhyayini was carried out by Longlian in the post Mao era. So, just to sum up, as you've seen, we've seen both, the, uh, both Tong Yuan and Long Yuan were uh, instructed in dual ordinations uh, well before meeting in 1955 by their two Vinaya masters. But uh, in, in 55 they met. This, uh, this uh, was the beginning of their 37-year-long uh, uh, friendship, and that uh, meeting really created the conditions for their cooperation in reinstating dual ordinations in the modern time, in the modern era. Here you can see uh, that uh, Tong Yuan and Kai Hui, her, her, her own Bhikshuni master, uh, they reached the Long Lian and Nanghai on Wu Tai Shan in 58. So Tong Yuan also studied with, uh, with Nanghai. Okay, so I have now reached the, the, the third part of my, of my talk. And uh, um, so is fine. Um, here we are. So uh, as we have already uh, stated many times, uh, the first dual ordination uh, of the modern times was held in mainland China, was held in Chengdu in uh, 1982. And here you can see the female and male ordination masters at Wenshu Temple. Uh, significantly, uh, the, nine, uh, um, the nine candidates involved, they were all shikshamanas. So as you can see, uh, Nong Lian and Tong Yuan really wanted to reinstate also the shikshamana figure. Tong Yuan had uh, organized a second dual ordination in 84 in Datong, Shanxi, and, uh, and after that, we also have a small, if I can manage, a very short uh, video. After that, in 87, a uh, new ordination, uh, dual ordination, was held in Tiesianse, in Sichuan, involving more than 20-some, um, 20-some, involving 20 some uh, shikshamanas again. Um, so after that, dual ordinations progressively became uh, the most common procedure for bhikshuni ordination in mainland China. Since the, the uh, year 2000, they are, um, they are stipulated by state regulations. Uh, as for the shikshamana, uh, it is not completely common, but it has been Less, it has become less uncommon uh, than before, and this is uh, clearly due to Long Lian's and, and Tong Yuan's efforts. And also, uh, the Shramanerika ordination is nowadays mostly bestowed by uh, a female master of dis discipline rather than by a bhikshu, as it was a very common habit in the past. And this, again, may, may be seen as uh, an influence of the uh, the charisma and the, and the deeds of uh, Long Lian and Tong Yuan. Here they are. Um, so let us now try to reconstruct the process that led to the introduction of dual ordinations, also drawing from the new material that has been recently released. Um, 
Lonlien was officially assigned the task uh, to uh, organize the first Bikshuni ordination um, of the new year in 1981 in January 1981, after the fourth meeting of the newly restored Buddhist Association of China. Um, so in January 1981, the first uh, bhikshu ordination, so male uh, monastic ordination, uh, was held in Beijing, Guangxi's. And, uh, and uh, Longyan was, ju was, was uh, um, just been elected deputy secretary general of the Buddhist Association of China, and she was requested to uh, revive the Bhikshuni ordination. Why was it necessary to revive uh, ordinations? Because there had been a ban on ordinations for Bhikshus and Bhikshunis that lasted uh, 25 years. So it was necessary to restart the system in a way. And uh, as we've seen, in 48 or 49, uh, Longyan had been tasked by Nanghai to revive uh, Huifu, they used to say, to revive, uh, to restore uh, dual ordinations. So when Longyan was asked by the Buddhist Association to restart Bhikshuni ordinations, it was just simply very natural to, to, uh, for her to think to conceive of it uh, as a revival of dual Bhikshuni ordinations. So this is probably the first reason why Longlian came back to the dual ordination, uh, um, to, to the dual ordination system. Uh, the, she was asked to do so, to, to revive Bhikshuni ordination, and she decided to use the dual ordinations. But there was also another more official, more, pol more political reason. <laughs> Because the first dual ordination in China was actually connected with the attempt to re-establish the Sinhalese Bikkuni Sangha. So as I told you before, Sri Lanka really has a role not only as the initiator of the dual ordinations in the 5th century, but also as uh, instrumental to re instate dual ordinations in, 19 in the 1980s. Um, this uh, idea was uh, initially supported not only by the Buddhist Association of China, but also, and for diplomatic reasons, by the People's Republic's uh, political authorities. According to, jo uh, to Long Lian, Zhou Enlai himself was involved in this, uh, in this uh, process uh, when he was in Sri Lanka, either in 57 uh, or in 64. Uh, he discovered that female Bikku Sangha there had, had disappeared and um, proposed to, re, um, uh, to uh, revive it through the um, quorum uh, composed by uh, Chinese Bhikshunis. So um, this idea came back in the early 80s and actually uh, it was supported um, and actually Joe, um, sorry, the um, president of the Buddhist Association of, of China at that time uh, asked Long Lian to conceive, uh, to, um, to um, uh, take care of the ordination of bhikshunis from Sri Lanka. So you can see we have here two different uh, topics that were uh, united. On the one hand, Long Lian was asked to revive the bhikshuni ordination for Chinese bhikshunis, and on the other hand, she was asked to help reviving the bhikkhuni or, uh, um, ordination in, uh, of, from Sri Lanka. And so eventually, for diplomatic reason that I've never been really understood, the ordination for, of, the, of the bhikkhunis from Sri Lanka did not take place. Uh, but it was instrumental for the reinstatement of the dual ordination system in China, because this provided Long Yan first and then Tong Yuan as well, uh, the uh, support both by the Buddhist Association of China and by the political authorities. So throughout the year 1981, so from February down to the end of the year, the two Bhikshunis exchanged the letters discussing procedures and related relevant issues. So in the letters, 
Tong Yuan, we only have Tong Yuan's voice here. So I'm always going to talk about Tong Yuan now, and then I will go back to Long Yan um, kind of drawing from uh, in interviews she released afterward. So Tong Yuan actually, uh, in the first letter, invites Long Yan and uh, this other nun that you see in this picture, Din Jing, who was also Nanghai's disciple and who was also involved in, the, uh, in, the, in, in, in this process, she invited them to Wu Taishan. But uh, Tong Yuan uh, health was, uh, had problems, so she had to stay in Beijing longer. And then Lu Lian could never make it to Wu Taishan afterward. And this uh, obliged them to discuss everything through, uh, through letters, and that's why we have this valuable correspondence with us. Uh, in the first letter, uh, by the way, uh, Tong Yuan also mentions that, uh, Tong, that Wu Taishan was a very good venue for them to do research. They keep on talking about doing research, and actually we can see that they went through texts, canonical, extra-canonical texts, even extra-canonical texts that uh, had been re-imported from Japan during the Republic. So they really made a lot of, of, of research, and she also mentioned that on Wu Taishan there were two Vinaya masters, uh, namely Qin Hai and Ji Du, who had been, um, who had been uh, disciples of Neng Hai and who could have helped them and eventually really did help them in uh, making research on this issue. Um, okay. So it is clear from the very beginning that the restoration of the uh, Sinhalese Bikkuni Sangha was instrumental. It was a chance to carry out the reform of the ordination system according to orthodox standards, that's how they perceived it, that they wanted to do regardless of the Bikkunis, of the Bikkunis from Sri Lanka. So here we, we will, I will read some of the material here with you. Um, the Chinese can read directly the Chinese text. This is a tentative uh, uh, translation. Uh, all the translations you see are still tentative. It's not uh, yet uh, the definite, uh, tr definitive translation. So please uh, help me in improving it if you can see something. So, Tong Yuan writes to Long, Long Yan and says, when you mention that Sri Lanka brought up the possibility of transmitting the dual ordination, your motivation appears as beautiful as that of the masters of the past. I can only praise you for that. If this is confirmed, I will be a member of the team and participate in the event. However, whether or not we achieve this goal, we must be ready to do more. We should advocate that in the future, for the nuns in Beijing and Suzhou who are seeking full ordination, the dual ordination system be restored. If in the future the precepts will be transmitted in this way, it will be a great achievement for Buddhism. Mahaprajapati and the 500 women who sought Buddha's blessing were given the eight Guru Dharmas. After that, the bhikshunis received the precepts directly from the Buddha, and later they were ordained by the two Sanghas as prescribed by the Buddha. Shouldn't the latter procedure be the standard? So this was dated February 14. Immediately afterward, uh, Tong Yuan also uh, raises some uh, problematic issues. And the first problematic issue, of course, is the leg legitimacy of the one sang ordination. And she asks uh, Long Lian, if under difficult circumstances the precepts are only bestowed by the monks, uh, is one regularly ordained? So Long Yen, uh, we don't have the answer by Long Yen here. We have an, the answer of Long Yen in, another, in an interview, so I will go back to this later. The following uh, letter addresses another technical and problematic issue, that of the Sik Shamana. This is uh, addressed many times, as, as you will see throughout the correspondence. Um, and she, uh, uh, she tells, she writes uh, to Long Lian, 
I would like to hear your advice on the following. In compliance with the Vinaya, Ashram and Erika, female novice, must first be ordained for two years as a Shikshamana and study the six rules before taking full ordination. And we, here we have a practical problem that she's facing. As we have to comply with the Vinaya, should we make the nuns from Sri Lanka take the Shikshamana rules now and have them study the precepts for two years? Or for mere expediency, should we transmit the Sikshamana precepts just before bestowing full ordination? Strictly speaking, the former is preferable. However, if the period of time is too long, it becomes a problem, of course. And we don't know what they decided to do for the, uh, for the bhikkhunis, uh, from the, for the nuns from Sri Lanka, as they never arrived, as you know. But we know what they decided to do for the nuns from China. They had to be to wait the two years of the Shikshamanas before, going, uh, be before receiving dual ordination. So then they go on with other pre uh, preparations in other, in other, um, in other um, letters. So on April 3, for instance, Tong Yuan writes uh, uh, again to Long Yan, mentioning the translation of the ordination manual to be used uh, at the ordination of, for the bhikshunis from Sri Lanka. It's the same uh, manual that we will see in a while, the dual ordination manual um, that was um, uh, republished recently, and so uh, we will see that again. And uh, and then here, uh, as you can see, uh, we also infer that uh, they were uh, preparing for a trial ordination, which is interesting, and that uh, uh, and they uh, and that they were consulting also the bhikshu community on the procedure. You see, this is a dual karma. We need to pr respect the opinion of the venerable bhikshus. I don't st I go on with the following. So in, on June 6, uh, you don't have it here, but uh, Tong Yuan goes back to the idea that the dual procedures should be used to also to ordain the Chinese candidates. And so they were un understanding the, the first ordination to be both for the Sri Lanka bhikkhunis and for the Chinese bhikkhunis. And, uh, um, and this is reinstated again uh, on August 23, where we read that where uh, Tong Yuan urges for the restoration of the dual ordination in China so as to remedy the long corrupted malpractice of the Wan Sangha system. And uh, again, she, uh, she mentions uh, the uh, candidates, uh, the, the, sorry, the, um, she mentions, mentions the masters that should be uh, involved in uh, bestowing the ordination. And she mentions the three masters that were uh, um, ordained in 55 through a dual ordination procedure that we've been talking about before. And, uh, and then she uh, goes back to the uh, issue of the Sikh Shamana again. And she, here we can really see that they were really doing research. So she, she states, yesterday I read the Nanshan notes for Bhikshunis by Dao Xuan. It states that only when a Sikh Shamana was, uh, has completed her two years studies can she be ordained without complexion. Ordination is not permitted. And then we can see here a question by, by Long Lian. So as for your query about whether someone who has been a bhikshuni for many years can qualify as having completed the Shikshamana studies, it depends on whether she has violated any of the six rules. Of course, according to the Dharmagupta Kavinaya, if, you, uh, if a nun, if a Shikshamana um, violates one of the rules, she has to begin again. Okay, so she, it doesn't apply, for instance, if a bhikshuni who has been a bhikshuni in China for 20 and more years has been eating afternoon. Okay, so that was a very practical but interesting question. Um, okay. So the last letter, September 14, 
um, talks, uh, addresses again details about the 10 Bikshuni masters. And this is uh, interesting because again, it, it, we can see that they were, had to cope with tradition, with texts, and, but also with the contemporary uh, contingent situation. And she states, uh, um, the contingent situation was a situation where there were few Bikshunis alive. In, 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 in China after the 25 years ban and after the Cultural Revolution, so it was not so easy to, to meet the quorum. And this pre contemporary situation was also a, a situation where many of these Bikshunis did not uh, yet put on robes again. So, and she states, as for the big Shuni masters, I wish all the people mentioned before are ready to shave and put on a monastic appearance for the ceremony. It needs to be discussed beforehand. If not, then it is entirely up to you to decide who should attend. Uh, after all, it was 1981. Lon Lian had been the only big Shuni who had dared to shave her head upon attending the meeting of the Buddhist Association of China uh, that very year at the, the end of the year before. The Cultural Revolution was just over, and the opening up of religious activities had just begun in 79. It should come as no surprise to read that some of the Beijing Bikshunis still wore secular clothes and long hair. So, do I have another 15 minutes? Yeah, uh, yes. More or less. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, then they discuss other questions as, as other issues as, as well, whether to, to hold the, this ordination in Beijing, which is considered to be too noisy, in Wutaishan, which is considered to be too remote, or in Chengdu, which is the final, the final choice. And, uh, um, and, uh, and, and then Tong Yuan urges uh, her friend to not to postpone the ordination uh, too much. Uh, she writes, considering the uncertainty of the, phys of the physical condition of the elderly Bikshunis, the the ceremony should not be delayed. Moreover, policies are uncertain, and it is not known whether there will be resistance in the long run. Okay, again, it was 81. So, eventually, as we know, the ordination took place in January, in February, uh, in January 82. And this is the ordination announcement published by the official journal of the Buddhist Association of China, Fayin, uh, in February uh, 1982. Uh, as you can see, uh, the bhikshunis uh, uh, that the three major bhikshunis of the of the um, of the ordination ceremony were Tong Yuan as master of the discipline, Long Lian as master of the formal act, and Din Jin as instructor. And then we have the seven witnesses. Uh, by the way, just it, it's uh, worth uh, uh, noti noticing the approval of the Buddhist Association of China, and uh, and also. The the implication that only dual ordinations should be considered fully orthodox and legitimate. Um, okay, so we now turn to the uh, lists uh, that were uh, recently published, uh, uh, the lists of the big Shuni masters, uh, of the witnesses, of the attendees, and of the new ordinees, and of those that were being reordained. What This is very interesting because it tells us uh, a lot. These two lists do not really completely match, but that is not so important. What is really important here is that, as you may see, Yes, better than I do, actually. So as you may see, here I see it better, uh, we have two groups for the uh, witnesses. No. So two groups for the witnesses, two groups for the newly ordained, 
and two groups for the uh, uh, for the attendants, uh, two groups of uh, and, and and then two groups of the ordained. Sorry, I, I say it again because I was confused. So we have first two groups of uh, uh, the witnesses. So the seven witnesses that form the quorum of the ten masters to bestow ordination. Two, not one. So seven plus seven. Then we have uh, um, two groups of attendants, again, seven plus seven. Then we have one first group of nine um, new ordinees. These are the nine chick shamanas who were ordained for the first time here uh, following the dual ordinations. But what about the following ones? We have 12 ordinees that were retaking the precepts. And if you have a look at the names, these names are the same names that we have up, up for the attendants and the witnesses. So this is uh, another term. So what was happening? Uh, these attendants and the uh, witnesses would one day act as attendant or witness, and the other day as ordinary, retaking the vows. And this is very well um, explained by Don Xin, uh, whom I'm translating here, so uh, I will just read it. As the dual ordination system was interrupted, the bhikshunis involved in the bestowal of the precepts had previously undergone one sangha ordination. The restoration of the dual ordination was a real and wonderful opportunity for them, uh, and they expressed the desire to renew their precepts. So notably, Long Lian and uh, Ding Jin, who did not receive a dual ordination, did not retake the vows. So they were the ma principal masters. That was not possible, but the others did. And there was a very interesting precedent uh, to this. As you may remember, I mentioned it uh, at the beginning. Um, so, Upon the arrival of the Sinhalese nuns in 433, Vinaya Master Gunavarma is said to have approved of the retaking of the precepts as a way to augment the value of the first ordination and thus without neglecting its legitimacy. So it was happening again what had happened in the 5th century. Okay, so uh, as for the textual reference, I have to run a little bit now. Um, the te textual reference was the dual ordination procedures, uh, as I've said, by Shu Yu, uh, which prescribes dual ordination within the triple platform ordination system. And the edition that you've seen before, um, and that I have been, I've begun to analyze recently, um, by the Jinlin Buddhist scriptures publishing, it was, uh, uh, was based on a publication, 1981, sorry, publication by the Hong Kong Avatan Saka Buddhist Lotus Society that follows a privately published edition of the rite from Tong Yuan's collection with notes. Um, from the preface, we learn that Tong Yuan received this manuscript from Vinaya Master Thajou. And uh, um, it is an ordination manual that was being, dis it is the, manual, uh, the uh, ordination manual that was being discussed by, then, by Long Lian and Tong Yuan in their correspondence, and which Long Lian was translating into English. So let me just go through some first remarks. So, um, the the Sejo Tong Yuan or Long Lian edition corrects uh, the uh, extra uh, the Xu Zhang versions, um, making them editing the ed editing this version uh, and, made it, and making it uh, more suitable for modern uh, times. So, for instance, we have uh, content our contents are updated. Uh, the phrase, may the emperor have great longevity, is replaced by may the people have happiness and long life, and so on. Otherwise, the text is edited in order to make the procedures clearer. So just heading left and right, for instance, so to make clear who should utter a sentence of the attendees, and so on. So this kind of, of, uh, of uh, correction and additions. But what is really more interesting is another uh, 
point. It's the title by which the candidates, the ordinees, are addressed. Um, before seeing what's happening, let's see very quickly something from Shu Yu's introduction. So Shu, Shu Yu um, shows here uh, that he was well aware of the Shikshamana figure. And it states that after Shikshamana has learned the precepts, an assembly of 20 pure bhikshus and bhikshunis should assemble to give the full ordination. So Shu Yu was aware of the existence of the uh, Shikshamana. However, in the um, canonical, uh, extra-canonical editions that have come down to us, we don't know if the text was changed after Shuyi or if it was already like this at the time of Shuyi, uh, only Shramanerikars are mentioned in the ritual parts to be recited, recited by the ordinees. That means that ordinees refer to themselves by calling themselves novices, not, shaman, not shikshamanas. Differently, the text employed by Longyan and Tonyuan only addresses candidates as shikshamanas. So you can see that they were willing to, uh, to uh, reform even uh, the traditional procedures in order to be uh, closer to an orthodox understanding of Vinaya. And if I, I may say, um, we can say that this is also a very modern uh, approach to Vinaya. It's, a, it's an approach that, go, that uh, evaluates normativity and orthodoxy. Um, so as you can see, the Tong Yuan ordination manual starts with the procedures of, of, for the Shramanerika ordination, which is bestowed by uh, Upadhyayini. Upa then it, this is followed by the Shikshamana ordination. Only at this point, Shuyu's or dual ordination procedure begins. So we, you see that's even more uh, orthodox, I would say, Rufus.